to have passion in life is everything. What's your Everest? Oh, is it yeah. that 200-inch box? They just look so impressive when they're wide. Especially running away. <laughs> Welcome to this week's episode of Eastman's Elevated. It's like a think tank for outdoor activity. It sounds exactly like my hunting. Just always thinking about it, always trying to evolve it and make it better. Here's your host, Brian Barney. Hey, what's happening, guys? I uh, got a brand new Eastman's Elevated for you. Um, so today's episode, it's one I've been sitting on for a while, but I'm really eager to share it with you guys. It's, it's just a great episode. Um, so I went over to the Eastman's office and we get, uh, Guy and Dan Bacar on the recording and they're talking all about their Tajikistan hunt, which was just this amazing adventure they had over there. And, and we also get Ike to sit in on the conversation. So it's the four of us and, and anytime you can get the, the Eastman brothers together, it, it's a really good time we um you know they they cut up and joke around a little bit and poke fun at each other so it's just a really fun conversation having all four of us there and, and then just hearing them break down this adventure they had with um damp car getting getting altitude sickness and being on death's door and um you know spitting up blood and i it was just crazy the high altitude the travel the roads and then them harvesting those sheep was just unreal. The Marco Polo, the the just huge twisters, and they were after just some world class rams. But um, it was so fun to listen to. I'm gonna listen back to it again. Um, and gave me good perspective. Dan Bacar, that hunts so many gnarly places and so much public land, said it's absolutely the toughest hunt he's ever been on. And so uh, you know when he when he tells me that, like I, I can get some insight into their their experience and insight into to how grueling and how tough that hunt was. So uh, just an amazing adventure, really fun conversation. Um, again, I've been really eager to share this with you guys. And now um, what we have is the Beyond the Grid episode of the Marco Polo Sheep is, is out where you guys can watch it. Um, so, uh, I also can't wait to, to look over the footage as I've seen little clips here and there, but, um, I'm going to watch over the whole episode and, and, uh, probably watch over it today, uh, as, as now it's fresh in my mind, but, um, really cool episode. I know I really enjoyed it and I think you guys will too. Um, our sponsor for today's show, uh, our sponsor for today's show is Beyond the Grid TV. So, um, it's Eastman's internet TV show. And so you can find it on YouTube. Uh, you can find it, uh, through the Eastman's website, but it's called Beyond the Grid. And I've talked about it before. Dan Bacar and Guy Eastman spearhead this project and, and the in internet tv just doesn't have as many constraints as as the typical tv that's on the outdoor channel which is which is good but so they came out with this this internet tv show where they can slow down the kill shot they can show it over multiple times there isn't as many restraints and there's more freedom in the storytelling you don't have to break each one up with a commercial break and then come back and get up to speed again and you can watch it in its entirety um, so they're just doing a great job. I know I got Dan a bunch of footage from my caribou hunt, so I think he's going to put together an episode for Beyond the Grid on that, so be on the lookout for that. Um, Dan just put together an awesome episode for this wilderness elk hunt and grizzly bear territory. That was a, a great episode, and now this Marco Polo episode. So they're hitting it out the out of the park with this project, so make sure to go check them out on uh, Beyond the Grid, and uh, make sure to, to watch the footage that goes along with this podcast of this Marco Polo sheep. Um, so so neat to, to share this with everybody. Again, just such a fun conversation with these guys. This is just a great episode. So um, enjoy. I've been talking long enough. Let's get all these guys on here and get this podcast started. So um, Eastman's Elevated, the Tajikistan hunt. We've got Guy. We've got Ike. We've got Dan Picar. And then um, me sitting alongside and, and uh, really fun. Here you go. Okay, I'm over here at the Eastman's office. I'm sitting down with uh, Guy Eastman, Ike Eastman, and Dan Bacar. Um, so, so really glad to have you guys in here. I've been so interested in your guys' last trip. Um, I pronounce it wrong every time, but uh, Tajikistan? Yep. Of uh, what an adventure you guys had there. You it just it right. sounded amazing. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I've been practicing. <laughs> uh, what a trip. Uh, just everything from start to finish. But I guess start with the, the travel of getting there is that's part of the adventure. So you guys took off from here, huh? 
Yeah, yeah. I mean, from here to Denver to Chicago and then Istanbul and then Dushanbe and then 20 hours in, in a car, you know, a, a pathfinder up in the mountains on some of the roughest roads you've ever seen. Oh, the roads looked insane. Some of the corners <laughs> on there. They had a TV show years ago showing some of those roads and that thing. But I saw one of your posts there, one of your pictures, uh, going around a corner with a big semi coming at you. Yeah. And there was barely one lane that could get by that corner, it looked like. It's insane. Yeah, the Premier Highway. I mean, I think it's famous for having, you know, the crazy cliffs and everybody drives like they're a race car driver. And Do they? It's a white knuckle the whole time. Oh, yeah, it's the craziest thing I've ever seen. <laughs> huh, what do you think <laughs> yeah it's pretty 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 crazy that's uh I, they don't do much road maintenance there no road maintenance yeah. and a aggressive driving too oh yeah yeah, I, yeah. I, <laughs> I think they use their horn in one day more than i've used in my whole life okay. and i'm not kidding that's serious i mean you probably 30 40 times a day nah, 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 nah. they're honking at people or rigs or yep. whatever they use it for multiple things probably i'm here and get out of my way exactly. it's not an aggressive gesture like it is here if you use that your horn that much in los angeles you'd be drive by shot up like swiss cheese <laughs> <But> <laughs> there it's just how they drive yeah. just hey i'm here i'm coming around you look out okay i'll move yep. over just give you a yep. beep for a warning as yep. they come around yep. you huh? yeah mm -hmm. or like people in the road there's oh and people walking all over the road you know as you're going in from start to finish, you think you're in some remote area, but there's a village and there's people on mm -hmm. the road or in the road or something. So lots of warning. Beep, beep, beep. Oh, dust, yeah. dust cake, three-year-old kids sitting on the curb with huge Chinese semis with probably 24, 28 wheels on them, blasting right past them at 40 miles an hour. And the kids are just sitting there watching cars go by, f trucks two feet from them. Yeah. I mean, it's it's the craziest <laughs> wow. thing we've ever seen. Just like, a different world than what we're used to, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. completely, huh. completely. Yeah, um, that's crazy. And so you, um, I, I wouldn't want to drive there in the towns or on those roads when you don't know what the rules of the road are. Like, you got to just sit back and just relax. Now, there's no backseat driving. There's no any. Just trust your driver at that point. Yeah, yeah, there's no. It seems like there's no rules. It's a free-for-all. Especially in town, cars honking and all over the place, it's like what you see on TV, like in Thailand or whatever. The only thing they didn't have there were the the scooters and the dirt bikes <laughs> buzzing in. That would be a whole different level. Because it was winter. Yeah, they said we we asked them about that, but it's because it was cold. So yeah, so they quit driving the bikes around. But yeah, it's a complete free for all. Oh so. wow! Their stoplights have a countdown. So you're sitting there, red light, and it goes 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, green. Can you imagine what a mess that would create? <laughs> yeah. Los Angeles or Denver? Yeah. I mean, this is drag racing. <laughs> yeah. yeah. To Jeek style. style. Yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. But they, they just live with it. I mean, they do drive on the right side of the road, though, yep. like we do. Yep. Okay. Um, so you guys had a couple days of flights to get out there, and then you guys hopped in this land cruiser. And then what town did you guys leave from or city? Uh, Dushanbe. Yeah, Dushanbe is the capital. The capital, yeah. Okay. Yep. Big area of probably the biggest city in Tajik, isn't it? Three or four million people there? Yeah. Yeah, a lot. Oh, yeah. wow. Yeah, it's a big city. Airport was packed? No. Um, we got in at four o'clock in the morning, so it wasn't bad, but okay. yeah. I think usually it's pretty busy. It's a camping. small airport, yeah. about the size of Billings, maybe a little bigger. So before you yeah. got to Dushanbe, how many hours were you traveling? Before you got to Duchamp Bay, because I know you spent a couple of days there, yeah. trying to acclimate time zones and all that stuff. But how many hours in it, basically, transit? Uh, you see, but you go from Billings to Denver is an hour and a half. Denver to Chicago is two and a half. So probably and then eight hours, no, ten hours to Istanbul, yeah. and then five hours from Istanbul to Duchamp Bay. So yeah, we probably with layovers, it's two days. Isn't yeah. It? Two like days, forty-eight solid. hours. Yeah, yeah. We got on in the morning in Billings and flew to Chicago, and then flew out that night. Flew all night. I mean, you're halfway around the world. Exactly. Dushanbe has twelve yeah. hour, twelve time zones different than here. That was so, kind of yeah. cool. We, we were talking in Inreach, and I'd be talking to you at eight in the morning. You'd be eight o'clock that at night there. I always knew yeah. what time. It was. That yeah, made it easy actually. Yeah, yeah. And I knew when to call out or you know text out to and. So it actually was pretty simple. Wasn't texting me at 2 in the morning. Yeah, exactly. I appreciate that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Tough to get used to the time difference, 12 hours. Yeah. I mean, 
coming back was easier for me actually. And I don't know if just cause I was so tired, but coming back left more of an imprint on me than going over probably because you're less excited, you're sick and you're tired anyway, but going over, you know, you're excited. And so the, the whole travel doesn't wear on you as much, but coming back, it's just all back to back to back and four days straight of travel for four. I mean, I've never been in anything like that before 20 hours in the vehicles and then hurry up, hop on the planes. We got stuck on in Istanbul for a full day. And so of course now, you know, Americans aren't allowed to immigrate to Turkey. And so we were stuck in the airport for 24 hours. Oh. And so we we ran up to the gate and our plane was taxiing taxi. to, <laughs> oh, to no. the runway and we said now what do we do? I said well the next flight to Chicago is three o'clock tomorrow every day at three so there you sit did, in the airport till twenty four hours. Did your luggage make it on that plane? No, that's good. It stayed with us, yeah, because that would have been well, as far as we know. I mean, we don't really know we never saw it till we got to Chicago anyway. Yeah, I mean, they tagged it in Duchamp. I, don't, I think it was on our flight Yeah, in Chicago. Yeah, I think it, – because it, it did come in with us when we actually landed in Chicago. Yeah, usually in my experience, when you're flying with guns, they make sure the luggage gets on the right plane. Mm-hmm. The, especially foreign airports, they do not want guns just laying around in the mm-hmm. baggage, in the tarmac, anywhere. So, on, honestly, you uh, usually – not don't get your luggage lost a lot of times when yeah. you have guns yeah that's nice per- in foreign to, airports yeah, per- american travel, airports you, don't care <laughs> right <laughs> they yeah. throw that stuff around yeah. yeah exactly um yeah you got to be careful with bow cases and gun cases they show up damage or your luggage or uh they're not very gentle with your stuff that's for Ew. sure you better pack it right mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. unless you're flying foreign airlines which were awesome mm-hmm. they the were service yeah. and the food yeah. and you get on the airplane and seats are pretty nice we had exit row seats going over and they bring you a hot towel you're like wiping down and everything and they have like pillows and blankets and i mean you don't get any treatment like that in the u.s i can tell you that i always see up in the first class them getting towels up yeah. there but they never bring them back to me in coach yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, never back there. yeah we're peons and coach and they're bringing them back oh man hintity hint hint alaska airlines <laughs> <laughs> take notes on this <laughs> So uh, you show up there, start cruising in the Land Cruiser, these sketchy roads, and then how much driving did you have to get to hunting camp or to hunting location, or where did you guys start from there? Well, they break it up in two days. So you drive 12 hours the first day from Duchambe to another town, then you spend the night there, and then you drive six more hours the next day to camp from that town. So it's 12 and 6. Wow. You guys are tired of traveling by the time you get there, ready to go hunt. Oh, yeah. 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 And it's um, extreme high elevations. And so guys hunting Marco Polo sheep, and then you're going to video the hunt for them, right? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then the Ibex, too. But, you know, it didn't pan out. But, yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, you guys get there, and then how's the hunt start? Um, uh, Acclimate okay? Yeah. I mean, everybody gets there, and we hang out for a day. You know, they don't just go trudging off into the mountains immediately, you know, so guys can get acclimated. But everybody goes out and shoots their guns and makes sure everything's on. And usually guns are off or they shoot different than what you think, you know, than what you type into your little program before you go. It still shoots, you know, higher than what it says on paper it should shoot. No, four guns there and not one of them shot without being adjusted. Oh wow, part that's that, got to be a major. Got to be elevation, though. Doesn't I it? think that's what it is. Everything's yeah. way higher yeah. than what it should have been. Yep, and yeah. and like you were saying, Dan, even though they tell you what it should be at, you know, fourteen thousand feet, uh, you also have to proof it, oh, and the yeah. proof never seems to be quite right. Yeah, you, you don't know unless you go. You just got to go there and test it because, mm-hmm. yeah, the the equation on the the app only gets you so far. Oh, well, even those turrets those guys had on those long rangey gun gadgets, they I don't know if they make a sixteen thousand foot turret. So yeah. they had what, ten thousand foot turret was what he had, but he still had to do trial and error on rocks out to eight hundred yards or whatever, a thousand yards to figure out what it really needed to be. So then he walks around the hills the rest of the time with some kind of 
makeshift mathematical equation in his head that's like if it's 400 yards it's half a click above if it's 700 it's four clicks above if it's 900 then it's <laughs> seven clicks above <laughs> minus one <laughs> click for windage you know and i'd have to have not my shoes off everybody didn't <laughs> yeah. I mean, nobody and brian they said that they're like none of these guns will shoot like you guys think they're like oh we'll go shoot one bullet and see make sure it's on he's like no I've never seen a gun come in here that didn't need some adjustment because you cannot. I mean, the camp's what, 12,500. There's no way you're not going to simulate that shooting at home. Hmm. I mean, you'd have to, okay, find a shooting range at 12,500 feet in, in the U.S. They don't, don't exist. So Too everybody many variables. had to be tweaked. Every gun had to be tweaked. Elevation, yeah. humidity, just travel. For God's mm-hmm. sakes, bouncing around in a rig for 20 hours, that's not good. Right, right. Yeah. Oh, what what a difficult deal because it's this hunt that you've waited your whole lifetime to do and you prepare for it and you shoot your rifle. I mean, I guess you just got to be familiar with it and comfortable with changing your changing everything out when you get there. Um, but that's got to be a mind trip as well as you're going on this hunt that, that you've been dreaming about for so long and you get there and then your rifle isn't shooting right, you know, or you have to adjust mm-hmm. things. So what did... Um, uh, what was your effective range out there? Did you have to step back your f- effective range and go, okay, I'm only going to shoot this far or I'm not going to shoot? Yeah, I mean, you can say that, and then you climb a 17,000-foot peak and everything's out the window, so to speak. You but one chance. They, you know, there was not one gun that didn't have to be adjusted, and there was some significant uh, resistance to guys – wanting their guns messed with even though they were a little off these guys did not want to monkey with their guns they didn't want to move it oh we burned a lot of ammo burned a lot of ammo but they'll tell you those at those sheep the the miss rate is over 50 percent wow and that's a big animal it's not like they're it's not like they're antelope size they're they're big right yeah 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 500 pounds Roughly. 500 pound sheep that little is wild. shy of that they say they, they i don't know they've never really weighed them not a lot is known about those things i mean they don't study them or anything so they're not really 100 percent sure mm-hmm. how much they weigh but i'm guessing it's roughly a little bit south of 500 pounds so that, that whole thing is like the kiss principle keep it simple stupid otherwise mm-hmm. it gets really really complicated in mm-hmm. really really far away from parts yep yep, yep. how'd your other gear handle out like clothing and backpacks and sleeping bags and hats well, <laughs> gear gear wise i think we were both wearing everything we brought with us really I mean, at camp it was probably zero every morning and then of course as you go up exponentially it gets colder and so you know at sixteen thousand, it's probably 15 below with wind is that yep probably about we don't have any thermometers but it's so cold your fingers don't work batteries freeze up you're wearing everything that you have and like Brian Martin, the guy we went with, he's like, yeah, there's really the only thing that makes you comfortable up here was the, the Sitka Blizzard parka in oh, those yeah. pants, too. He Which said, I've put those on and went, when would you ever use this? That's it's like exactly. walking around in a sleeping bag. That's like what that piece of clothing is built for are those zero-degree right. hunts and the pants, too. And, you know, I didn't, I didn't have the pants. I think Brian did, but I had them. I never wore them. I yeah. probably should have, but the, yeah, the coat. There's no way. Nothing else. I, I don't know what. A couple other guys in camp did not have those, and they were really not comfortable at all. Yeah, Brian Martin said there's nothing else out there that will keep you warm. Really? Yeah. As oh. far as heavy duty, and it has you know the wind stopper and everything. Everything, it, and it durable enough to be oh, rolling yeah. around on the rocks and. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. It's basically. I mean, it's like a raincoat, an insulated raincoat, uh, you know, the, the blizzard parka. And, you know, you got the shell on the outside, and then you're wearing a sleeping bag, basically. So, nice. yeah, I couldn't imagine being there with anything else. And, you know, we were pretty comfortable. but Well, that's a cold hunt, too. Um, there isn't any heat source, right, in your camp. There's no stove. There's Oh, yeah, yeah. We, there, yeah, we stayed. I don't even know what you call it, a house, a cabin. I don't even know what shack. You, yeah, it's a shack, and they've you know renovated it a little bit, and they actually had a a pretty cool 
you know, radiant heat system built in there with a wood stove. Oh, wow. And then they had a sauna in there. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. And then so that we, if their stoves are heating the water and the pipes running through. And then each room kind of has like a radiator mm -hmm. of the radiant heat. And so it was actually pretty effective. And they put a, a flush toilet in there last year. Mm -hmm. So it has some pretty good amenities. Oh, yeah. At least you yeah, can get no, inside yeah. and get warm yeah. somewhere. Yeah, absolutely. Um, still frigid cold when you're out hunting, but at least you can get warm at night somewhere. But you guys actually did a, a spike camp from there as well? Yeah. Um, yes. You did for your sheep? Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And so then you had to sleep on the mountain. And I think you were telling me earlier you and Brian slept out or Brian slept out in a pup tent um, out there one night. Yeah, I slept in the shack with the – or the – sheep herder hut whatever you want to call it rock and dirt dung hut with, <laughs> with the help because it had a they had a yak or a stove in there they burn yak dung okay for for heat but he slept out in the tent i that was i was like uh no it was like 15 below that morning when we got up it was pretty pretty cold that's a cold can yeah we didn't have yeah. the bag enough to do it you know you bring 15 yeah he has above. a negative 20 degree Brian expedition did, yeah. bag yeah i've got a 15 above oh, bag i'm like no <laughs> no it doesn't work not gonna work I, you know i didn't anticipate spiking out but you do what you gotta do mm -hmm. up there yeah and that was the time period i didn't even get a go on that mm -hmm. on the actual kill because that's when i was dealing with hape mm -hmm. so brian's like oh we gotta go up this way and i was like you know who's hape <laughs> 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 the, yeah high altitude pulmonary edema which is that altitude sickness. Yeah. Yeah. Wow, that's the, crazy. Yeah. And last you're... levels of altitude sickness. Yeah. There's altitude sickness and then there's altitude hate. sickness death. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wow. When you're in such good shape and you were hunting all fall long, you know, I would I would think you'd fare the best up in that high ele elevation, but you guys were telling me it's actually the opposite. Uh, the more fit you are, the more problems you have. Right, right. And I, I'm no doctor, but this is what I gathered from past clients, Brian's doctor and the guides, is the better shape you're in, the more the altitude is going, going to affect you. If you have low blood pressure and a slow pulse rate, the altitude is going to affect you worse than it would somebody else that has maybe high blood pressure and a higher pulse rate. So that's why I eat McDonald's. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so for once, you go on a hunt, and all that salt and not working out is going to pay off for you. <laughs> <laughs> My heart's used to this. Yeah. <laughs> well, literally, the guy, you know, he wasn't in great shape. You know, farmer dude, and he didn't work out or anything, high blood pressure, and he never had one problem, never took one pill. Mm. No problem. And talking to the guides, they're like, oh, yeah, you know, the, the guys that train physically and prepare the most for this hunt are the ones that have the problems. And so, like, I'm putting two and two together. And people have to leave all the time, leave their hunt early because of altitude sickness, talking to Brian and Kyrgyzstan and Tajik. Like, because that, that's your – you have three options to get rid of HAPE. You either take steroids, a steroid for it, um, oxygen therapy – or get below 9,000 feet. Those are your three options to get rid of it. And after three days of, well, actually 24 hours of, of being on Cialis, I was starting to show some. Like smiling Bob Cialis? <laughs> <laughs> like, hi, this is Bob. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Grins? <laughs> if your erection lasts longer than five hours. <laughs> How does that work up there? <laughs> yeah. Poor ghost. It doesn't work. <laughs> well, that's the, the, the good part out of it is, you feel so crappy, you're so tired, and you're so sick. That it doesn't that's do that. That's the last thing. Yeah. yeah it doesn't. So that's the thing. See, Alice, like, people here are like, oh, my God, you're on boner pills. Huh? <laughs> like, it's, it makes a good story. But see, Alice just dilates your blood vessels. And so your body can – you get better blood flow through your whole body. Mm -hmm. And then your body can absorb oxygen or, you know, whatever mm -hmm. more efficiently. And so that's, I think, played the biggest role on my body absorbing that lung or the fluid out of my lungs. Because that's, that's the big thing. The last stages of HAPE is, is the fluid in the lungs. And that's the number one killer of mountaineers. Like they go Everest and all, climb these high peaks. Like guys that you push the envelope and you die from HAPE. Water in your lungs and you can't, you can't move. You can't do anything. Is it water? Is it water it's, or it's, is it blood? It's like, well, blood it, you know, is kind of like the last stage. 
like for me it was just yellow fluid like frothy some of it was froth frothy mm-hmm. fluid but if you start getting like pink you're, you that means your lungs are bleeding from Ooh. like coughing and, and that's what can give you permanent damage like you know i'm back now i'm fine now right. i don't have any side effects i shouldn't have any side effects or long lasting or long-term side effects from it but if you let it go too long don't get treatment you got permanent damage to your lungs or death <laughs> so yeah it's nothing you want to mess with so walk us through the stages how did how did it start yeah so i mean the first night you're sleeping up at twelve thousand feet and your shortness of breath and yeah guy you had the same we were both waking up and you everybody know. did the problem yeah. with it is is everybody has the same symptoms initially yeah then your body either adjusts to the altitude like all the rest of us did or it goes downhill into this spiral that yours did yeah it yeah. all started off the same. Yeah. Everybody felt sick. Yeah. You know, headache, maybe some nausea. You're a little bit nauseous. And then, but like 48 hours into it, it was like I was telling you before, it's just like a light switch, just like a sword through the chest feeling for 12 hours. And then my joints, super achy, nauseous. Just you feel like crap. You're and like, gosh, did I drink something, eat something on yeah, this disaster? You swear or, cold. Come yeah. Or like a flu or, yeah. you know, the plague or something. And then just like, (laughs) (laughs) yeah, like I'm going to die. I mean, I've never had, it's like you're having a heart attack is what it felt like. Just like I said, sore through the chest. That's the only way I can describe it. Mm. And then like a light switch, pain's gone and the fluid starts building in your lungs. It was like, I'm laying awake all night with the pain. And then all of a sudden it goes away. And then all of a sudden you can feel the rattly of the fluid in your chest. And it wasn't bad at first. And then we went hiking, you know. The fluid started at like 4 a.m. Then we got up early and went off and hiked from 14 to 16,000. And that was really, I don't want to say nail in the coffin. It wasn't, you know, death yet. But, I mean, you saw me hiking. It was probably pathetic watching me try to hike from 14 to 16,000 feet. Yeah. Just couldn't was. couldn't do it. You walk 10 little baby steps, and then you're trying not to throw up. You're trying to breathe. It felt like, you know, a belt is just tight around your neck. Just like, <gasps> just like tough time breathing and then that was the big thing for me is and you guys paid to do this huh? <laughs> <laughs> paid to get tortured. <laughs> but no you get to the top and i laid on my back and gurgling you start coughing roll over and just coughing up fluid like Dye! like i've never seen anything like that that's more fluid than you would ever you know you get sick you cough up mucus or whatever you know you're coughing up fluid like a tablespoon of fluid Oof. like yeah something's not right Oh, that had to be so scary to being in a foreign country like that and not knowing what's going on with your body, that intense pain, and then the fluid. It had to be really scary up there You do not want to end up in a hospital in a foreign country, let alone a less developed country. You don't, huh? No. That used to be developed called the USSR. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. (laughs) That's as far as it was developed was the Soviet Union. You could have rode the camel over to the new hospital in Afghanistan. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah there's probably a U.S. hospital right across the border. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Afghani that, doctor probably went to Harvard Medical School. Yeah, no kidding. No kidding. But luckily, Brian had a past client, doctor friend in uh, Washington, D.C. that I was texting him. I got a hold of him quick, and he's like, well, if you're my patient, I'd tell you to get your butt down below 9,000 feet. That's what you do to get rid of it. And logistically, it's kind of difficult for where we are at. And, you know, I told him I was getting better from taking the pills. And and uh, he's like, well, if you want to take a risk like I would, you know, hang out for a couple of days, try to get acclimated and, you know, take a Jeep ride up to 14,000 or whatever and don't exert yourself, but just hang out, you know. And so I did that for a day and a half. And then, you know, the last third of the hunt, yeah, I was good to go. You know, like I was saying on Cialis too, you're, you're <laughs> hiking from fourteen to sixteen thousand, like you're hiking here. You know, at Down four the street. at four thousand, yeah, you're, you're just cruising right up, no problem. Cialis is a game changer. It's huh? a game changer. I, I hear it, guys. Uh, how it's a perf- <laughs> performance enhancing drug that a lot of guys are using for uh, ultra running and and different things, but you could really notice that big of a difference on it. Huh? Oh, huge! Huh. It almost like not fair. Oh, wow. But I've heard it, like you're saying, athletes mm-hmm. are starting to take it when they come, you know, to higher elevations to compete or whatever out mm-hmm. in Denver, you know, you're mm-hmm. a mile high. But it, it's a game changer. It really is. There's just no ifs, ands, or buts about it. 
So you're saying Huge. I need a Cialis prescription, huh? Doc. <laughs> <laughs> I'm having problems here. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you're only 30. I know. It's rough. <laughs> <laughs> Just be glad you're not in my shoes. Now give me that subs- <laughs> subs- prescription. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Oh, but. man, how wild. So you weren't able to join in on the hunt. And so, Guy, you had to get started. Um, you only have so many days to try to harvest one of these Marco Polo sheep. Ten days. Ten yeah, days. Ten days. Okay. And yeah. so you teamed up with Brian. Uh, you guys probably looked around there and couldn't find any that were closer. had to go move to that spike camp then? No, we found the sheep, the band of rams, the day Dan got sick. Yeah, we found, that's when we found the giant. Was yep. that day and I was. It, it was uh, a band of... 11 rams i think they're, they would drift two a couple of them would drift in and out of the band but it was n- between nine and 11 rams depending on the day and we found them i think there was nine of them that day first day yep. and there was it, it was the biggest band of rams he's ever seen or like, any of the guides had ever seen in 20 years there uh, like, not bit in quantity wise but the biggest the band of all big rams all giants so I mean, the, almost a- all the average score is was way above normal. Yes. They're all gold medal rams. Almost all of them. Yeah. yeah. The, of the 11 rams, there was three that w- they would not recommend shooting. Three semi-younger rams that maybe someone would, would shoot. But of the 11, there was eight that were all 56 or bigger. Wow. 56 yeah. inches. 56 was probably the smallest of the big eight. And then the biggest one, of course, is that big 64-incher. 64. And <laughs> so so for the audience, what's what would be a comparison on something they would be – they would like uh, elk or deer or something? If you equated it to mule deer, you know, the 64-inch ram, you'd be talking like, oh – we're talking like a 300 inch mule deer. Oh. I know, so like a 420 out of, mule out of elk. the realm. We yeah. ended up killing that 64 incher, and he is he'll be new number 15 or 16 in the world. So there's only 15 bigger rams ever killed, ever bigger than him. So I mean that's that's about what you'd have with a three. Uh, there's more than more 300 inch mule deer killed than that. I think there's 28 of them or 29. So, oh, wow. so so you're fi- talking giant. Now you get to the lower end of that. The 56 inches, 56 inch ram is like probably like a that's like a 200 inch deer, 200 inch yeah. mule deer, like a 190 bighorn. Yeah, it's all yeah, like the, that big upper horn, up to like 205. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So like that th- that th- if you're talking bighorns, that that 64 inch would be like a 206, 207 bighorn sheep. Jeez. Maybe two, yeah, and then the the smallest ram in there, smallest shooter ram would be, you know, one ninety. You know, well, and like yours, yeah, would be like a two hundred inch bighorn. Yep. You think? I yeah, mean, one ninety five, two hundred. Yeah. It's huge ram. Wow, it yeah. is a yeah. huge it's, it's ram. Gold medal, yeah. yeah. I mean, you, you, to put it in perspective, can you imagine just going somewhere and you look at eleven <laughs> bighorn rams in the pre rut and eight of them are over one ninety five? You know, nine of you know, seven of them are over two hundred. Yeah. It would just be, especially uh, when you'd absurd. never seen one before. It, it's yeah. the twilight yeah, on the hoof, zone. and you go. So, uh, so we never looked yeah. at any other sheep. Mm-hmm. You know, Brian was like, and the guides too. The the local guys were like, this is we're not. Why would we go look somewhere else? No matter what these rams do, we will find them. We have to kill two of the rams out of this bunch. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so. and it, it's um and and they're really wary too, and it's wide open terrain up there, <laughs> and, and you guys are hunting sixteen, seventeen thousand feet for these things. So now that you found them, now it's a matter of trying to make a play and trying to get yourself in range of them. It's the pre rut, so they're they're banded up, but they're not with the ewes yet. It's about a week or ten days before they actually show up with the ewes to mm-hmm. rut. But they're doing their sheep thing, just like our bighorns are kind of smashing heads, kicking each other in the nuts, doing, you know, what bighorns do. And, um, but it's an unseasonably warm there, as much as we and complain dry, about no the cold. Snow. It was dry and warm, and so the rams were way higher than normal for that time of year. They were all fourteen to 16,000 feet. Yeah maybe 15 was probably average i mean yeah they hung at 15 15 5 the whole time and normally they're down like 14 down the valleys that's why you hunt that time of year because they're a lot lower 
and you you know a little easier to get to but uh, they were unseasonably high and so you have to go after them you don't have a choice you gotta you gotta take it to the hunt mm-hmm. if the hunt won't come to you so off we go and they are so weary we the day he got sick when we first saw him we hiked up there and we watched him for hours just they never moved just yep. sitting there on a point and you cannot let them see you two miles away though they're gone I see ya. it's all wide open Yep. There's no trees, not even any willows, no sticks. It's just grass, dust, and granite. That's all it is. Lots rocks. of rocks. And it's so it, – the country's so big. Like, you're not going to just get close. Like, you know, in Wyoming, if you can see something, you can probably go kill it. But the country is so big in the premieres that just, be, you know, you see something, and if they're not going to move, there's just no way you're going to get closer. You know, you're not going to just go loop around a giant basin. You have to go seven miles. Massive country. So you just sit and wait until yeah, they, you just, until they do something. They got to get in a better spot. You know, they'll look at yeah. them and go, "Well, you know, I know how to get to those rams." The local guides will go, "Yeah, I know how to kill one of those right there, but it's going to take us two days to get there." Because you see them here, you have to go back that way up a totally different drainage yeah. for seven miles, like Dan said, climb up and peek over the top. You cannot let them see you and they it's not rough country is part of the problem with it it's not rough and tight it's, jagged, it's wide yeah. open and rolling, rolling and and up and down but not straight up it's not cliffy so they they can see for miles all the way around them all the time but there's lots of wolves in there so they're they have a lot of predators so mm-hmm. they're pretty used to being mm-hmm. cagey man which really cagey. which moves them around a little bit Probably. Yeah. yeah, weather and the wolves. Yeah. So yeah. they'll pick you out moving a couple oh, miles dude. away. Oh, yeah. Thing that's Unbe- incredible. Stands in my mind how spooky they are. We drove up around the corner in the Jeep, and you're like, way up there, and there's a ram bedded on the skyline, a little tiny white dot, at least two miles away. And we got out, and we look at him. Probably within a minute, he got up and moved over the ridge, just uncomfortable with being in eyesight of us, even though we're just a little speck to him, probably. Just insane. Yeah. <laughs> That's not normal. I'm leaving. No. Yeah. yeah. That one at the end there. Yeah. Even just, the ewes and lambs. Cage you run right up a mountain and out of there. Usually, you know, our ewes and lambs just look at you like, oh, that's cool. We're not going anywhere. Yeah. Yeah. So how? F- so you said seven miles. Um, how fast can you move in that country? It's got to be slow. Unbelievably slow because of lack of oxygen and all the other things. Yeah, that's the big thing is – you spend all your energy climbing up to the sheep or to a ridge a couple thousand feet up to 16,000. And it better be somewhat decent and easy for you to navigate around and move up when you're on the ridge. Because if you have to go cover another massive distance, it's probably not going to happen just because it zaps your energy just getting there. (laughs) And so... Man, that's so wild to hear about. Yeah. It's like uh, climbing Everest or climbing some of those. Well, and you guys had twenty thousand foot peaks in the backdrop. I see one of your pictures you were showing me. Um, but yeah, it has to be so wild where you have to manage your your energy yeah. level like that in that high altitude. Yep, yep. And it's not nothing like you know what we're used to bow hunting. You hike up somewhere and you see something, you probably go run over there and kill it. But you can't. You don't have the energy there to do that number one and it's such big country it's just not happening hmm. uh, no other explanation it's just not so gonna happen i wow. i heard you guys talk about th- that you've met some people uh i think it was in the airport system on the way home that that were marco polo sheep hunting but didn't have that type of experience mm-hmm. it was a lot less uh extreme yeah i mean there's a bunch of different camps and where we were it's it's a marco polo camp you go there to kill giant Marco Polo, some of the biggest in Tajikistan or in the Middle East that are huntable. I mean, there's Marco Polo in Afghanistan and China, I think, that aren't huntable. So if you want to kill a giant ram, this is kind of the camp that you go to. And, you know, Brian has other Ibex camps, other Marco Polo and Ibex combo camps in Kyrgyzstan and in Tajik. This is solely, you know, what I got out of it, too, is a great Marco Polo camp. And that's Brian Martin. Yeah, Brian Mount, or Asian Mountain Outfitters. Yeah. 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 So there's definitely a lot of options for somebody if, if they wanted to go to different, you know, depending on what experience they want. Because like the guys that we ran into, they're driving around. They called it like a Wyoming antelope hunt. 
they drive around and shoot sheep from the the, the rig. You don't get any, very many giants, but you get your classic, you know, curl and a half Marco Polo mm-hmm. from from the, the which Jeep. is like a fifty inch. Fifty. What did they say? Fifty-two. Uh, they sh- they shoot f- yeah, fifty-two to. They, and they have killed sixties doing that. Yeah, I mean, yeah. They, they do, but they're on a, a different spot. That's a high plateau where the sheep winter and rut, and they were rutting a little earlier. So they see a lot of sheep. Like they're seeing high numbers, thousand, thousand it, sheep. Yeah, wow. we saw Jeez. a few hundred. Yeah, but we didn't look a lot because we just honed in on that one band of rams yeah. and didn't really care about anything else. But there are places you can go where it's an easier hunt. I mean, mm-hmm. it's all tough in the elevation, but not as physically strenuous as there. They, yeah. the, they kind of, the locals kind of call that the walkabout area because you've got to walk. It's all walking mm-hmm. there. Uh, but it has a potential for big rams if guys can walk. But it's a true mountain hunt. It's not, you know, shoot them from the, the Jeep type mm-hmm. hunt. Now, maybe in December it could be if yes. they're down in the bottoms. Yeah. Because according to what they said, they get uh, they do get dumb like our sheep when they rut in yeah. the heat of the rut, which is about now, mm-hmm. December, middle of December. Yeah, yeah. But the the temperatures then are really brutal, and you you can't get around. If you get too much snow, then you know they can't get around. Heck, you can't even get to camp if there's too much snow. Yeah. They're saying the uh, Premier Highway. I mean, it yeah. gets snowed in or whatever. You might not even get there. Yeah. So going that time of year is risky in its own way. Everything's risky there. Yeah. Tough logistics. Like Brian says, he, he said, of course, he didn't tell you this when he's trying to book you as a hunter. He tells you after. <laughs> after <laughs> the, once you get there in camp, he's like, oh, Marco Polo sheep hunting here? It's like war. Like, <laughs> like war? Like, what do you mean? We're on the border of Afghanistan and we're going to have to shoot our way out of here or what? <laughs> yeah, you guys are no. 400 yards from the Afghanistan border. Uh, he's like, you're just, everything is against you. It's yep. war against the mountains. It's war against the elevation. It's war against the sheep. It's war against the help. It's war against the language barrier. It's war against the weather. He said, e- nothing yep. here wants you here. The sheep don't want you here. The weather doesn't want you here. The, your body doesn't want to be here. And you have to buck the odds. But you learn a lot about, a lot about yourself yep. going there. I will tell yep. you that. Unlike almost any other place I've been. It's, well, it sounds to me like it's like it's the serious. most extreme hunting possible it, it, it you is, can't yeah. you yeah. sure you can go on a polar bear hunt where it's colder but there's no elevation you can go you know you can go uh el- to colorado on a mule deer hunt but you don't have the weather i mean it's it is every single thing you could stack against you Absolutely. is stacked against you uh, the, you don't unlike any other species with the exception of maybe polar bear i've never met someone who's so into Marco Polo hunting that they go all the time and have uh, even a half a dozen of them. It just doesn't happen. Hmm. Like Dad's buddy Rich Pierce said, you want to get your sheep and get the F out of there. <laughs> that's how that country <laughs> works, and that's how it, it's a bucket list hunt, but it is so uncomfortable that you don't want to go, gee, I hope I come back next year. I mean, there's one guy in camp didn't get a ram. That poor sucker has to come back. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Everyone felt bad for him. Not the fact he didn't get a yeah. sheep. The fact he has to come back and do it all over again. But he was excited. But He, I mean, he passed it, it up is, a lot of rams, Yeah, too, he though. did. He did. He, he had his chances. But it just – it is like in no other hunt I've, I've ever been on. And it is – every part of it is difficult difficult but it's it's rewarding once you're done but mm-hmm. at the time you go what the heck did i do every part of your subconscious is saying let's get out of here call it so it's it's a true mental test oh it like you do anything like here now like for a mental test so nothing compares so you're saying you guys reset your perspective bar yeah, yeah. i've yeah. seen a big yeah. deal this ain't it <laughs> exactly if you want it yeah that's a good way of putting it because it's be sitting on the mountain in a in a lightning storm and go, eh, you know, this is dangerous, but I this is nothing. My belly's full, I'm not sick. We're good. Exactly. It was so I I just got tired of being cold. You just get I mean, you can live through it, must you know, power through it, whatever, tough your way through it, but after ten days, I just got tired of being cold mm-hmm. all the time. Yep. Yep. I mean, your hands are just always cold. Your your nose runs nonstop, nonstop, nonstop. You, you're always dehydrated because your water freezes. 
solid. You're always hungry because you can't eat. You don't have much of an appetite, but you're still hungry because of elevation. You feel sick to your stomach. Everybody gets sick. Everybody gets sick. Hmm. You know, the water there is just... Uh, there's stuff in the water over there. I'm sure they don't even have any of them identified. <laughs> Everybody <laughs> I know true. that went over there was sick. Oh, uh, that is crazy. I mean, I dropped 21 pounds. You dropped 10. T- 21. <laughs> which yeah. 10 pounds off of uh, all 10, season. 10, yeah, 10 pounds off you is, yeah. I, I lost another four or five, but I, I didn't yeah, I don't have anything. I would probably lose muscle over there. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you didn't have 10 pounds to lose. No. I probably had 20 pounds to lose, but I did <laughs> lose it. But I mean, we ran into one of our f- a friend, a, a Jim from – Jim, Jim Wyndham, yeah. And I didn't even know he was over there, and I didn't recognize him. He walked right up to me, and I did not recognize him. And he he lost, oh, he had lost way more than me. 30 or something. Uh, we'd, been his eyes sick. were all sunk in, a beard, you're just a skeleton of himself. And he'd been sick twice. He got sick one round there when he first got there, took some pills, got rid of it, then got it again before he left. So, I mean, it's just... It is brutal. What brutal an extreme place. environment. Yeah. Uh, how is the food? you guys bring your own food or you eat there? Mix? I don't ever care to have Tajik food again in my life. <laughs> <laughs> Some people like it. Two of the, one of the guys who was with us liked it, but he's from California. I don't <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, I... We brought a lot of supplemental stuff. Oh, th- I think that drove him crazy because I had so much food with me. Yeah. I had a bag of food for every single day. Yeah. So I didn't have to eat that much of their food, but... Their food was, mm, I mean, the first time you eat it, well, that's different. It's kind of good. After it two weeks of eating you. it, you're like, come on, guys. It wears on you. You yeah. got to bring supplemental stuff if you want to keep your energy up. Some of the stuff was okay. I eat pretty much anything, and it was okay. You know, but I'm sure glad that he was like, here, bring this stuff. Like, he kind of told me on what to bring and what he was bringing, and so we kind of planned that a little bit, and I'm so glad we did. Jerky, tuna fish, granola yep. bars, pop tarts, yep. things like that. But they, I mean, yeah, lots and, and of jerky. their foods. It's it, it's, it's I'm different. Sure it's different. Yeah, it's just like rice with stew over it, kind of thing. And difference, yeah, seasoning. And it probably not giving it a fair shake because like you're sick the whole time. Like for me yeah. with the altitude, it didn't thing, taste good anyway. The sick stomach. I didn't want to eat. That was another thing with hay is you lose your appetite. So I didn't eat for like two days, and I got really shaky, and so like nothing ever tasted good anyway. Mm-hmm. So that probably didn't help. Yeah. So. And you eat it when you first get there. That's the other thing, before you get sick. And so then when you're sick, all you do is think about that food you ate, mm-hmm. and then they feed you more and more and more of it, and you're just like, ugh. Yeah. It, it was... Uh, I didn't. I didn't care for the food too much. <laughs> that is so. <laughs> but I'm pretty <laughs> picky eater, you know. But I don't like mountain houses either, which they ate some of those when we spiked out. And I, That's pr- I don't like those. I'm like, uh, I don't need that much sodium at this. Yeah. I don't sure. either. I don't yeah. eat those Explode. either. Yeah. So I had tuna fish. <laughs> yeah. Oh man! So it finally came together on your ram. What a beautiful ram! And so you guys harvested uh, ram for Brian. Uh, which was that giant one you were talking about. Man, was that thing a curler. So heavy and so curled. But yours was a beautiful ram. Um, so much mass. And I, the curl goes way down by the jaw, like so low, like twice as low as a bighorn ram would go. And you said 58 yeah. inches was your ram? No, 56. 56, 56? almost 57. That's um, a but beautiful really, ram. really, really heavy. Yeah. Really heavy. And we saw him the first morning, too, in the sunlight. Um, the problem is when you have one as big as Brian's in there, you don't. Everything else looks small compared to that because it's so gigantic. But there was another sixty incher in there. Wow! Like they will, they will see one sixty inch ram a year, and to see a band that has two sixty pluses in it is almost unheard of. They had to; those rams had to have come across the river from Afghanistan or something. I mean, you know, they, those sheep don't live real long to start with. I mean, ten. They've never killed a ram over ten. All those big rams are usually eight, nine, ten, and uh, to have that big of a bunch of them all the same age, nine, ten years old, pretty, pretty rare. That's actually pretty amazing. That ten years old, and you look at sixty inches of sixty inches of horn. That's a yeah. lot of growth in one year. That six must inches. be some amazing gro- groceries up there. Yeah, they grow six inches a year, or you know, one of our rams will grow three and a half, so twice they'll grow double a year Jeez. in a year than ours. Uh, the the protein must be crazy because there's not a yeah. lot of feed. You look around, and go, what are these things eating? 
that's exactly what came to my mind is what you said because you're up there and there's not there's hardly anything up there there's like some a couple little shrubs here and there but for Rock. an animal to put on that much horn with that little food and be 500 pounds and be 500 pounds i just it blows my mind honestly they have sagebrush there just like we do yeah and it grows at most Stunted. three to four inches tall yeah, a little three to tiny. four inches. So oh, you, that's perfect for sagebrush. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Manageable. Yeah. Yeah. So you wonder, you wonder what their summer range looks like. It must just be knee deep grass, and then it burns off, and it's got to. Do be. they graze it? Oh, oh my Are there freaking? So it's like Mongolia. Grazed. They uh, graze everything. Yeah. Everything. So the sheep and ibex are stuck with finding the feed that the goats, sheep, and yaks can't get to. Yep. Mm-hmm. So not much I mean, left. Not much left, especially on the winter range. The winter gets a lot of them. Hmm. Yeah, man, the number of dead rams. Oh, it's just you just every basin, big old horn laying there on the ground. Jeez. Oh, really? Dead ram. A horns. winter kill or something. You pull into some of those sheep yeah. camps. Of course, there's no one there now because it's winter. But there would be piles of ibex and sheep horns the size of a VW bug. Oh, just wow. piled. In so a like pile, two or three yeah. of them in there. Yeah. <laughs> a couple hundred. Yeah. Just There's piled. so many horns. These guys use the horns to build their fences with intermingled in the rock. You'll see this on Beyond the Grid. That's, I mean, just horns everywhere. And you can't bring them back. You know, you can't bring them back to states. But like you say, piles of horns, they incorporate them into their fences, their rock fences. They pile them at every sheep herder's hut. There's a pile of ibex and sheep. So this thing's going to be on Beyond the Grid, right? Is it? Is it? I don't. I can't imagine how you're gonna nick this down to a ten minute episode. Is it gonna be like a series? We just gonna have a Beyond the Grid series, <laughs> Tajikistan <laughs> one through twelve, the twelve part series. Yeah. <laughs> it's Dang gonna man. be like Lonesome the Lonesome Dove. Yeah, no kidding. <laughs> I don't know how we're gonna get it cut down. We will. It'll just be all the best, the best stuff, which will be yeah. great for people watching. That's what we want to put together but two big ram kills thank goodness we didn't yeah. get any ibex we don't have to worry about incorporating that in <laughs> 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 said no one ever <laughs> so it'll just be sheep but it's there's a lot of a lot of material there yeah. for sure to cut down definitely a photogenic culture environment camp oh, e- everything you was wanted to take a picture of or take video of yeah, it's a world's different. So that was fun for me. Yeah. And he, like, we're out there shooting at the range, and he's like, oh, look at this. And he pulls up a freaking Soviet uniform button. So there's so much history there. Oh, Jeez. wow. And so, I don't know. He was probably geeking out. I was geeking out, like, oh, this is sweet. I would go, you know, looking around for stuff. You're looking you look for, for one for two days and couldn't find another one. Yeah, <laughs> nobody could find another Soviet button. <laughs> but. <laughs> Yeah, so it's tons of cool stuff there. Yeah, that's gonna make a really cool episode, yeah. and you're gonna do a pretty quick turnaround on that too, right? Yeah, January fifteenth, or turnaround. What today's the fifteenth, so about a month. Yep, we want to get it whipped out and yeah, have it ready. So this will be the the first one for 2018. Yeah, so it's and the footage is incredible of the sheep. We have a lot of live footage that's that's I've never seen. There's not a lot of great footage of Marco Polo sheep. Most of it is there's one running, a band of rams running up a hill and bang, 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 down goes one kind of stuff. Uh, but we have a lot of behavioral, just sheep being sheep and button heads and and doing sheep things and up pretty up close footage. I mean, it's it's pretty, it's going to be pretty incredible. Do you have any footage of up goes the sheep and bang, 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 and they all run off? Oh yeah, yeah. We have just some a of little that bit. Too. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> just a little bit. We've got got a lot of that. Yeah. Is there, what was that. the distance you guys were shooting over there? Well, there was yeah. guys over there that were shooting up to a thousand yards. Oh my gosh, that's the thing. Like you know, we didn't. The manual says, "Oh, you need to be proficient to 500." It's like, no, they want you to shoot to 800, and you better be ready to shoot to 800. But you know, you could shoot a ram at 179 yards. Yeah, I killed mine at 207. They were closer than that at one point. They were like 85 yards. Brian shot his at 426. That's 64 incher. Yeah. Yep. Wow, and you got to so be able to shoot. Don't, you, yeah. Yeah. And with your gear not all dialed in at a higher elevation. Gosh, that's tough. High degree of difficulty on that hunt. Uh, absolutely. It'll make you look like an amateur, dude. <laughs> yeah. Seriously. Like, like Brian said, he said that, you know, best, best hunters in the world come into these camps and it's a 
more than a 50 50 chance they'll miss yep on the first shot it's just it you just every time you go on a stock you're just thinking oh my gosh i hope i don't have to shoot right now because you can just feel your heart rate high you're out of breath everything you know last thing you want to do is try to lay down and, and make a shot but you just have to you know it's seventeen thousand feet you gotta lay down and calm yourself as much as possible and make a make a good shot there's a lot of motivation to do it because you don't want to go do it again tomorrow if you don't have to yeah you just want it to end at some point you're like i hope <laughs> i hit this ram so this can all be over and i don't have to go chase them again because every time you miss them they go deeper and further yeah. into the mountains yep oh, that is wild. harder and harder what? or higher and higher yeah what an experience, you guys. I can't wait to watch the footage and watch the film when it comes out. Um, like you say, there just isn't much out there that you can watch on Marco Polo sheep and in that environment. Yep. Um, that is just crazy. What an experience you guys had over there. So going back next year, huh? <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm going to I'm gonna take a break from it for a little while. i to save up for a taxidermy bill probably. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh, that's going to be really cool. Yeah, what a beautiful sheep. Yeah, congratulations, guys, on the experience and on the hunt. And uh, How cool. Uh, thanks for sharing with me, and I can't wait to watch the footage. Absolutely. Perfect. It's our pleasure. Have a good time. All right, All right guys, that's a wrap. Um, again, just such a fun conversation, such a wild adventure they had for those Mo Marco Polo sheep. Um, so crazy to, to hear the stories and how it all went down and, and just the – Oh, I say trials and tribulations too much, but um, it, it's uh, their trials and tribulations they went through on that hunt were just amazing. So uh, really fun as I just I love adventure hunting. And so um, that one just speaks to my soul and, and uh, fun to the, hear those guys so fresh after the hunt where it's still fresh in their minds and they, the experience is still right there. So um, can't thank those guys enough for for being on and, and uh, sharing everything with with me and with us and. Uh, our audience so um, really cool uh, sponsor for today's show was beyond the grid tv so again that's eastman's internet tv show uh, make sure to check it out we're putting a ton of effort into this and and really trying to get some some good episodes uh, we can we can really tell the story in its entirety and um, i think this thing is only going to grow from here and and only going to get better um, so, uh, make sure to check that out beyond the grand, find it at, uh, YouTube or find it on, um, I'm sure you can get a link or find it through the Eastman's website there. And, uh, with that, let's wrap this thing up. Um, I'm hitting the road again, going to make a steelhead trip over to the Olympic Peninsula, which is the coast of Washington, the farthest, uh, Northwest tip, uh, of the lower 48. Um, it's not a hunting trip, but, uh, there isn't much I can hunt right now. And, I just love steelhead fishing. I grew up doing it in uh, western Washington where I grew up there. And, and then as I moved to Montana, I kind of was able to improve my skill set at, at you know everything uh, that has to do with fishing just because we have so much quality trout water where you just learn the, you, you learn the details or you, you learn um, – how to read water better. You, you learn where the fish want to be and, and uh, where they sit, and then you learn the bugs better and how to be more efficient with your weight. So anyways, I know this isn't a fishing podcast, but this is what's on my mind right now. So um, I learned a lot in Montana, and so now when I get to go back to the, to the Washington coast and use all this knowledge that I've gained over here and then fish for – um, just the, the wildest fish out there, like these sea run rainbow trout called steelhead. And, and these steelhead are so close to the salt, you know, they're right out of the ocean. You're within 15 miles anywhere you are and you're in this coastal rainforest. And then, you know, some of the water out there is just this glacial fed teal blue color. And then, you know, the fish you catch are so iridescent and so bright, just hardly any color to them. And uh, they fight so freaking hard. <laughs> like they, you hook one and it is an absolute rodeo. I mean, you're lucky if you catch half your fish, but they're acrobatic, just absolutely full of fight, scream on your reel. Um, they're just so much fun. So we like to take our fly rods. I got a group of buddies out there. Uh, I actually got one of my good buddies that I'm staying with. I'm going to try to talk him into being on the podcast. Uh, his name's Eric Polson. And, um, Gosh, I started hunting with him like 
him and a, and another one of our bu- uh, buddies, uh, Brian, like I, they were older than me by about 10 years or so. And when I was in my young 20s, they, they kind of took me under their wing and they just showed me this extreme way to hunt for, for elk where they just absolute pushed the limits. And, and I was able to, you know, I was able to tag along with them or able to be hunting partners with them. And I, I learned so much from these guys. And, and, um, you know, it's part of the reason I'm the hunter I am today was, was just this experience I got in my early 20s going with these guys that were so hardcore and still to this day Eric's one of the best elk hunters I know he uh he doesn't really like to hunt anything else but elk he just loves bulls and so he goes really hard at it um and and I really want to get him on the podcast but uh, anyways get down there um have some fun try to catch some steelhead and uh just live life to the fullest we're only here for a short amount of time i'm gonna try to fit in as as many fun things as i can while still taking care of my responsibilities so um that's kind of my mission statement so um i'm psyched i uh i'm still running by the seat of my pants i'm just trying to take care of everything with the podcast and the business and so i haven't even started packing but i i'll throw my stuff together throw it in the truck and then take off tonight and be down there for a week or so so uh be looking on my social media for um some fish posts hopefully um i can find them they call them the fish of a thousand casts and sometimes they can be really tough to find in these river systems where you can go days without even hooking a fish but you just keep believing there's just these bright chrome steelhead running up this river and all you got to do is just tie into one for the fight of your life so um I'm super psyched. Hopefully uh, be able to catch some steelhead and have a good trip. So um, thanks, you guys, for the support. I got a bunch of messages on that last solo episode. I'm absolutely humbled that you guys will listen to me talk for two hours about backcountry hunting or, or uh, backpack hunting. Um, and, and and I'm humbled that you guys in, enjoy to listen to it and get something out of it and, and just a, a bunch of comments and positive feedback. And we're just growing this community. I did this podcast the other day with uh, Gabe. It's all about setting up your hunting bow from scratch and we got a little technical on it but there's some really good information but at the end he's just saying that he's got so much from this community of Eastman's Elevated and how he just wants to give back to it by sharing his knowledge and uh man I just that is that is so cool this um this community that we're building where we're helping each other out. I also had another guy reach out and heard about my water filtration system. And he has these drops that he's been using and these drops don't add any flavor to your water. I can't remember if it's alkaline or what it is. I haven't got it yet, but he reached out and wanted my address and wanted to send me some. And it, it's a great lightweight option for water purification. And so, you know, I'm always learning from you guys as well. And, um, I think that's the cool thing. Um, you know, everybody's willing to offer up, you know, whatever they have to offer. And that's me included too. I always try to get back to you guys, try to encourage you and try to answer any of your questions to the best of my ability. And, and also just answer, answer them honestly, you know, so you guys can, can get something from it. But, um, I've been blabbering on too long. I better, uh, I better finish this podcast up and, and, uh, get it out to you guys. So you guys can listen to it in its entirety. And, and just again, really fun episode. Thanks to the Eastman's for everything they do for the podcast and, and sitting down and letting me record and, and believing in me. Um, I, I just can't thank them enough and can't thank you guys enough. So, um, keep them working hard towards your goal. Got trip on my last word. How is that? Uh, keep working hard towards your goals and uh, hunting season's right around the corner and, and uh, uh, have as much fun as you can on this life. And, and we're, um, gosh, I, I'm blabbering on. Shut this thing down. That's the end of the podcast. That's it. <laughs>